18 and we'll be reading from verses 1 through 4. Abram was nine years old and nine. That's the King James for nine nine. All right. And the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thy perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abraham fell on his face and thought to him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with God so far. My covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. And neither shall thou be called Abram, and you won't be called Abram, but thou shalt be called Abraham. For a father of many nations, and I may be the word Abraham, and father of the great multitude of many nations. And I'll make thee exceeding fruitful, and I'll make these nations of thee, and kings to come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed. Underline that word seed there. You know, there's a place, there's a little notation out there in, in, in the Bible somewhere. Uh, as you underline the word seed, to Galatians chapter 3, verse 29. It says, uh, After their generation, for an everlasting covenant, to be the God of the end of our seed, and I'm going to the word seed again, after thee. And I will give unto thee, and to thy seed, and to thy again, of the land where all thou strangers are, the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So God comes to Abraham, or Abraham at this time. Now remember, he said some of the similar statements a few chapters earlier when Abraham was 75. He told him to get out of the country, out of the country, out of the place, and going around, he would show him. And, uh, and he was and he's making his seed fruitful, people multiplying and sending his seed to the stars and the heavens and so on. But now God comes back at 99, 24 years later, and reiterates this, makes it more personal, makes it more whatever. And, and, and this kind of a, this does take a little jump, jump on the, uh, on the side of the seat here. God speaks to you sometimes to put things in your heart, but it's not the language that they'll do it yet. It's there, to, it's there to speak. It's there to sit. It's there to, to, to just be on the inside of you. And then God comes back and gives you that. But right here, He gave him that word, which is the rhema word to him. Now is the time for the fulfillment of it. Amen. And so this is, there may be things in your heart that you haven't seen yet. There may be things in your heart that haven't come to fruition yet. And you've been sitting in your heart, but it never has really been that faith or that whatever. It really doesn't matter if you have faith, you know, God's faith is something, you can go out and do it. Now is not the time. Now, this is one of the things we miss, in the, in the, we've missed in the Word of Faith circle, is that when God begins to deal with us about things, it gets so real to us, we think we're supposed to go do it right now. And many times we're not, and so what many people end up doing is they either try to go do it in the flesh and, and hopelessly fail. Or they manipulate things and make some sort of what we would call success, but it's not what God wants. And they call trouble wherever they go. Hello? Instead of just sitting back and letting God let that thing see, and in the right time when God gives them that rainbow to that faith, that faith, that faith coming, then you can go do it. Then you've got to be dedicated, you've got to be patient, you've got to obey God, you've got to do the right thing. But I'm telling you, too often times we run out and try to do things on, on where God's just letting us know what's coming. And instead of letting God say, you know, time to go do it. Amen. 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 Now, I know, so I, I, I know what I can get into. I know there's a bunch of Bible students that they disagree with. You know? You can get a bunch of people who've been around about three weeks and think they know everything and they disagree with you. Hey, you know, But I can tell you something. I've walked things out. And I've watched ministers who've walked things out. And there's things that God spoke to people that were 30, 40, 50 years before it ever came to pass in their life. And what God spoke to them actually took place. Amen. You don't get frustrated. I said, don't get frustrated. When, God, when things are in your heart, but it hasn't been, it hasn't been released for the time yet. There are things coming in my life that haven't been, I've, I've wanted them there. I've wanted them there, we all want them there. We all want them there, we hear about them. And, uh, and I'm not going to get to the beans of certain things. But I, I, I'm going to have to tell on this little side journey for a minute. You know, this, this, this little thing is looking like an accident waiting to happen. But it's even after me running into it and knocked across the room or something. I mean, well, I think you said I could flip the mic and I hit Mr. C in the head. And he wouldn't like that, would you? He wouldn't like that at all. You know, when I first got saved, and you've heard, maybe you've heard this, but I'm going to say it anyway. When I first got saved, it wasn't just a 
a week or two and over there, but it did my heart. I was going to go to the next week. And I thought I was going to the next week. I did. I thought, man, any minute I'm packing up and heading to the airport and I'm flying to China or somewhere in the Orient, and I'm going to go preach to Jesus. Yeah. Three weeks, one week, two weeks, three weeks, three weeks, three weeks, three weeks, three weeks, three weeks, and then one year, two years, three years, two years, three years, two years, then a decade, two years, then another five years after that. Then it just went, you know, and it actually got to the point I forgot about it. Until that word from God came. Now, uh, back in the early 90s, a uh, uh, minister named Mark Levine started a series of Bible schools in uh, Western and Eastern Europe uh, named Gamada. And, uh, and he came to me, and, and, and I don't believe that all that story, but that, that's another story. But he wanted me to come minister in those cities, and I started to minister in those cities. I started all over the land, and I went to Cross, 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 and I went to Fallen Street, and I went to right outside of Rome, Italy, and Mexico. I uh, went to Barcelona, uh, Spain, went to Estonia, numerous countries. Uh, and I was ministering in Bible schools all the time, and just kids traveling and ministering. And, and kids, the whole family went four times. You know, we'd, we'd go work and take a week of vacation and tell them to preach in the city and just get a hard drive around Europe. And uh, it takes long to get from Paris to London to go to Europe and get a call to them. Over three years, Rob went to Paris for me. I ended up going to visit Swiss and the Italian trip. Rob was beautiful. Anyway, but that's just. Well, and doing that for a while, and even seeing the newsletter, one day his newsletter came in, and, and, and he was sharing how God had spoken to him. He was flying home, and, 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 and the Lord said, What works in Europe works in the, in the Orient. And the minute I saw that, the Lord said, That's how you're going. And it was almost 20 years after the first time I got a new life, I was just there. Almost 20 years. That's like that by the time I stepped on it. Stepped on land in the orange and hit this one and, I, and it's like, okay, I'm going. And it's, I knew I was going. And so, uh, and, and of course, things come up. You, you, you don't want to travel halfway around the world in coach. If you've ever flown coach, if you fly in Europe, bad enough. I mean, six, seven hours, eight hours, nine hours. But back in the Catacombs, it's kind of tight. Um, but, you know, Bangkok, Thailand is exactly halfway around the world. There, there, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's 11.30 at night there. There's 12 hour time zone there. And you have to change my watch. So when I got there, it was 12 hours different exactly. This was different. It was, it, you know, if I had no fancy watch that says night or day, I could have changed it. But I didn't have to change anything. It just got off. Oh, okay, it's 11.30. I, I didn't want to call it Daniel. But Daniel is midnight here. I mean, all that time, I mean, it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon, 3 o'clock in the morning, I didn't call her in the afternoon. And that's fine, and I didn't call her five. Hallelujah. And uh, so, you know, first thing, I, just, I, I, I got all the airlines, and you know, the Delta, and the ship, and I got to sit there, and I called him, and he's getting a ticket to Bangkok, Thailand, first class. He's got a ticket to him on the phone, and he's getting a ticket, okay, first class, please, we're going to Bangkok, Thailand. You know, uh, just connect out of Zurich, Switzerland, thirteen thousand and nine hundred dollars. Great man that I was, and he said, "How much is business?" Ten thousand nine hundred dollars. How much is coach? Thirty nine hundred dollars. So thank you, I'll call you back. Maybe. Got a phone. Where to go? Find me a cheap airline ticket to Bangkok. What's up? He tells that about 20 minutes later. Pastor, they're running a special on Northwest. That's just Northwest, you know, West. Instead of East. Didn't go through Europe. He went through Japan. He said, first class round trip, $3,600. How much is that? How much is that? How Yeah, no, no, no. Listen, I mean, coach is like 1800 But, um, uh, it's a first class round trip because we went west. And so, you know, 20, 27 and a half hours later, I got the call. I stepped off the phone to Carmel in Bangkok, Thailand. And it was 20 years after the Lord set up the church there. See, things could be in your heart, but it may not be the time. And you've got to stop pushing and make it, make it happen. 
people leave churches and they minister because they do things that shouldn't they do because they, they got something in their heart but it wasn't time. And what, what was supposed to happen, they, they missed it because they weren't walking out the time of God. They thought it was going to look at their heart when it was so imperative that they had to follow that and go do it. People split, no, 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 they split churches. They got something in their heart. They got to go do something. And they got to go past it. And they just made up behind the stuff they had to Now, one man, uh, a number of years ago, had, had come out of his staff. That person left him for about three, four years. Went out and did his own ministry. And when it came to talk to him, he said, Well, I'm supposed to do this. He said, Well, you got to do it in your heart. Well, I'll tell you something. When you do this, you got to do it in your heart. And you don't get blown half the back. Read it from your heart. Are you here? You're going home. I said, Are you here? You're going home. See, people a lot of times, they say, Well, I talked to them. They said I had to do it in my heart. They'll tell you, Go, go. It's not right. They're not going to tell you it's not right. Figure it out for yourself. So this person got me. Came back to the ministry. Came, you know, they, they asked him, he went found a place for him to work in the ministry. And then when the head of the ministry came to him one day, and not long after they got back, walked up and said this. Said there were things I was supposed to do, there were things I was supposed to do, there were things I was supposed to say, but I couldn't do them because he left me. And turned around and walked out. And just because you got something in your, something in your heart doesn't mean it's a time. And listen, Things you might have in your heart aren't as clear as they are when the time comes. Remember when God came to Abraham, or Abraham when he was 25, or 75, I think so. 75, and so we're going to start talking about making things too short and all this kind of stuff. And, 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 then, and then that, that period of time, he tried to offer the Eliezer, the Eliezer, the Eliezer, that guy. I want to talk about that stuff. I have a lot of people that do it. As the seed. God said no. And then at 87, you know, Sarah said, to him, Hey, I haven't had a baby yet. This is going to Hagar. He said, Okay. Now, this now, God comes up when he's up around this time and, 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 and he says, uh, Oh, it is no right. This is what it is before. He said, But he's not the one. You've got too many gifts now in ministry. Too many Ishmaels to do what people are doing things, so they're not following after the Lord. Too many offering their, their, their uh, steward child as the plan of God. God has a plan. And you can end up, as listen, the other plans are not being a sea plan. They are man plans that God said, okay, go ahead. And I'll do this. And you know, God even said that about Israel, he'll bless them. But he's not the sea. When Israel wanted a king, remember that? From that point on, the king became who God chose and God anointed, although it wasn't a plan. If you understand, God may have a plan, but we can alter that plan, and then he has to work with it the best he can, and it will, and it will not be what he designed him to be. The king of Israel caused him more trouble and more heartache than anything else they ever did at his feet. Well, David, you know, David, David was a murderer and an adulterer and a war watcher. That one wasn't good. He went to the girly show. That really went, we went on the rooftop. That's how the world is. You know, and the Bible says the time of the year when the kings went out to battle. What does that mean? David won't go see that. David remained behind in Jerusalem. Send everybody else to fight. He stayed behind. I thought the son of a king was sick. He heard about these rooftop baby parties. I mean, I don't know what else to say. You know, what else did he say? But the very first thing that happens after the stage is he goes up on the roof and God sees it and takes it about a bad method. And what does he do? Oh, oh, him out. They told him that the king said, You can't do that. No, he said, Who is that woman? Get her over to my house. But it's adultery. And it's forced adultery on her. She has yeah, no choice with her baby, too. Are you here? Get the face. Try to put her on. Try to have a cover up. He won't fall for it. Try to get him drunk. You get him drunk. You get him drunk. have a cover up. He won't fall for it. Sends him out and, and has him murdered. 
came were not from God's hand. I mean, the, you know, uh, uh, Daniel was so upset about the king coming, and, he, and, and God said, don't, don't get upset to have the king that was just to me. Why? Because somebody wanted to have something different than what God's plan was. God has a plan. Forget the power of the kingdom. Just, just forget it. I don't think we're going there. We're going to talk about the plan that God has for your life. God's plan for your life is not to listen. There are all those things stirring your heart. And I've seen, I've seen young ministers and young ministry students, you know, get something in their heart. And they think, well, I've got to go do something. And they don't even understand all the reasons something in their heart is they're operating without an outcome of the anointing of another ministry. And it is the covering and the anointing of that ministry that they're functioning to them. And then they probably run out and do it on their own and it falls flat on the face. Why? Because it wasn't, they, they weren't supposed to go yet. Or they weren't supposed to go at all. They were supposed to have that ministry. I think about um, uh, Billy Graham and then, uh, what, what's the thing? Come on, guys. What guy's saying? Huh? George Bell, what's the thing? He just passed away, didn't he? At 104. He spent his entire ministry serving. Today, that's hard to find. Why? I can do things. I can make a lot of money. I can get people that aren't just sold records and then they're not churches all over the earth about themselves. But he recognized that the anointing in the place that he was to serve that ministry. And he served it. And he served it with, with uh, in covenant with Billy Graham and stayed faithful to that ministry. As soon as we can get up and get, get our right, right packaging out there and get our right TV set, set set up and get our right newsletter and get our right web page, we're out to go on our own and, 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 and go out and we're out to serve in some way. We've lost the service part. I mean, first, we've got to get this right. This individual that wants to church has to get back to the right person. We, have, we can't be about it. It can't be about me getting promoted within the church. It can't be about me ever right back to that church. It can't be about me the one who has the title to the pastor in the church. That's one of the most nauseating things I've ever, I've ever experienced in my life is people trying to use, use things to be, to be close to the big dog and they can't have anything to do with the little dog. Amen. can't serve the church. can't serve in a way that prevents them. It's not about you. The local church isn't about me and it's not about you. Successful this ministry is not about me and not my, my ego and me being successful on a personal level. It is about accomplishing what God called us to accomplish. And we've had people leave the church well. That, that have said that hurt by the call. Force of the anointing come out. The things I need to do to become successful in the church, those things I need to get to within the church. Jesus helped me get there. Well, you should go stand in the line. What? Sit in the line. Sit in the line. I'm talking about how to be big enough to be opposite and you to do that. That's why revelation is that. Just keep understanding. See, things are in your heart. Sometimes people get some of these associated with it. Get things in the heart and go out and do them, not realize that they were with that ministry they were associated with that they were supposed to be in their life. Because they didn't move fast enough for them, or they didn't move like they wanted them to move, they were not good. And had a season of what appeared to be success. Let me tell you what, you can have something that looks like success that's not Bible success. What different success from Bible success? Do what God said and God said do it. You're doing something that God didn't tell you. So much so you're doing it on a different timeline. You can mess things up. You can you can set things off the course by running ahead and trying to jump start things before the season. You know what the Bible says about Jesus when the fullness of time came? Well, I'm glad we said we set down to the door. Jesus came to the fullness of time. 
Let me say this. The prophets, if they had had their way, would have had it 2,000 years earlier. You know, here you go home. They would have got Jesus here earlier, sooner. They would have got Messiah here sooner. Hello? They would have always looked at somebody being the Messiah, trying to elevate them to the Messiah here. And it wasn't the right time. There are times of God. And this is not to help some of you this morning. You've had things in your heart, and you're going, why I haven't gotten there, or things where I have this take place, why I have that happened, or whatever. And you've got to understand, you got to, sometimes you've got to take those things and set up and check back and say, now, Lord, I know that's in my heart. But you're going to have to tell me the right season and the right time for me to receive it and come to the back and get it away. As a young man, as a young convert, as a young Christian, the only time in my heart, I took the gone when I got there. I wasn't prepared to do what I did when I got there. I had a calling. I had a fear. I had a fire. And I had a squat knowledge. My first sermon I preached was while that month that I called the morning church to go to Raymond. They had to preach on Wednesday night about a month before I left town. In 15 minutes, I preached all my notes. I know you can't believe that. Actually, it wasn't 15 minutes, it was 10 minutes. I preached my whole sermon. And when I got to the bottom, I thought, I can't be done yet, so I went back up to the top and started over. And it took me 10 minutes to do it the second time. 20 minutes, I preached the same sermon twice. I had zeal, I had fire, I had a call. I wasn't prepared to quit. And then, and the more you prepare it, and the more you equip, and the more you're committed to the will of God and the timing and the purpose of God, the more you will become aware of your place in it. It's never about you. Your gifting and your calling and your purposes in the local church and the body of Christ are about others. Are you here? Your faith to receive the blessings of God, the needs met, and the, you know, and, and, and the take care of your body and your finances and those things, uh, that is about you. That's your faith for those things. But the purposes and the callings and all those things are about the church and not about you. It's not about how clean you can be. It's not about you know, how big of a ministry you can have. See, I understand. See, we've got to, we've got to, you know, your older church didn't give birth to it. It wasn't to allow zeal to flourish. I, I, I was sharing with one of the family friends that had a long conversation with him over his heart beat last Saturday. I said, look, you know, don't, 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 this is the older people. Let's give them the ministry of opportunity. Don't let the young guys direct you. Enjoy the zeal. See, the zeal is like the, the 50,000 watt power lines out there on the big uh, grasshopper, the big power pipe. That power unleashed in that state is destructive. If you, if you snap that power line in, it will provide no benefit at all. It will be only destructive. You can't break it. If you pick it up, it'll kill you. If it gets uh, dry wood, it'll start a fire. I mean, that power line will be absolutely nothing, but there's, there's no use for it at that voltage. In that raw state, you can't use it. Until you temper it, you transform it. So you step it down and take the raw, that raw power and begin to temper it and transform it into usefulness. And then it comes into your house, you know, the part of now moves out of plants three days later. It's kind of hot for you. You have a name, you know, 100, uh, 200 amps, it's virtually there. And you've got power coming in, just come, through, come off those power lines, drive through substations, you can kick down on those substations, sit down to your neighborhood, and then at the end of your house, it'll transform. And that transform ends up transforms it into the love and heart that you need to comprehend. Then it goes through your power box, and those filters, and those govern how much power flows without the system around. What's that? You've taken the zeal and the power and all that stuff that untempered it to be destructive. And you channeled it into a useful 
form of energy that is going to come about in complete and total darkness. And then the next few couples of those things rise and eat the water to be used for them. All of you know that the outlet is now going to run out of that. But that pain from that same power line that was left in the construction has been cut down to 50 feet. And try to use it for that place. Because the zeal had been tempered. See, the grandfather was the wisdom of the old one. Don't ever think you know everything as a Christian. Well, the Lord told me, you know. I love it because he said, Pastor God showed me. All right. See, you know, you're going to be hard headed and hard doing. Oh, when you come in and say, The Lord showed me, I'm so good. The Lord showed me that. The Lord told me. Because I'm saying, what do you say? You said, I'm raw power and I don't need strength for you. I don't need to be tempted. I don't need to be shut down and useful. I'm good just like I am. Amen. And the, the, the beauty of it is that that transformer can take that raw power. The older men and the older women were to help the young men, the young men and the young women, with the winter. I mean, don't you think sometimes they all say, oh, they're making a new Christian life, they got to be out there, they're going to be a little bit. You don't know your head from a hole in the ground. I do that sometimes. I sit my brain and say, this is a hole in the ground, and this is a hole in the ground, and this is your head. And I said, now which one's your head? They went down and said, oh, it's a hole in the ground. And so those things God has placed in you. And people will come on and they'll try, they'll, they'll, they'll either be the emissary of the devil and make their own mistakes. Or just because they're not, they're not mature enough themselves to understand that. Let me tell you something else. You do appreciate Christ and ministry and ministry outside the office of the pastor. You can't get counsel from them about certain things like you're going to get from the preacher. Because they're speaking from a different perspective. And I'm going to say something else about that. I'm, I'm, at the same time, I believe that a lot of our salvation should be practiced in the local church instead of traveling to it. Or is there a teacher we put in the church? What's wrong with going to the church and being a teacher in the local church? To help you train and believe it needs to be in the local church. We don't have to travel from church to church to church to church to church. That's what we do. Because we, you know, we have a church all over the world. But I don't even think that's what we're doing here. Though we're in the church of Antioch, so we teach them the prophet. Amen. Well, somebody can't hold to the can't hold by that thing. Start preaching the perfect under that thing. But it's those things. So we do got to have a different paradigm shift in our thinking about destiny, about purpose, about calling. And understand that the local church is the most important thing in the body of Christ. Amen. And if the local church has had all the money that we need to do the work of God that we do, we would be building, we'd be supporting the mission and we'd be establishing things for people in the other churches, helping help the Bible study and, and the missionaries to do the things they need to do. We don't need television ministries with eight, two million dollar uh, estates around the country, they flying over here making and have a hundred thousand dollar dollar dog park to all the dog food. A dog RV. Dog RV. Hundred thousand dollar travel package for dog. That's a little excessive. That's excessive a little excessive. How many people can you just think that? Now, the only dog that doesn't know is David doesn't have God. God don't want us to have you. God just says, no, no, God wants to bless you. So let's be, let's be sensible. People just send me the money off to all these ministries all over the country. And, 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 and people think that that's the most important thing ever because it's not buying into that. And the local church is the most important thing in the world. We've got to reach our city. We've got to reach our county. We've got to reach our area. It's a big gospel. And we need to snap this thing to somebody else's calling and our purposes. We need to be a 
Home here, but that didn't hurt. You know, it's not weird. Sounded real sudden right then, didn't it? Huh? Going in a little somewhere, and somebody said, You don't sound like an elevator. You're more of a man. They don't elevate it. You don't sound like a man. I'm going to go to the town anyway. Southern boy. Born to eat these pork bottles. Hallelujah. I like fried chicken. Hallelujah. As we come to conclude the understanding that, that God called Abraham, that Abraham said, I've been God, and I'll be the kind of God that I can call and send the most promises that are called and promised. But some of them in his heart, he wanted to follow what was in his heart, but it wasn't until it was known now that God came to Abraham to the faith to get it done. This time next. They ran in the front of the house. I was back, back in the front of the house, and she was going to go from the house. And then she was going to go from the house. 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 I get that. 
come there anyway. But it's not God like the body can be left out. And just before God can get put on such out, it's like the foot of Jesus is being left out there. If you be in the church, if you be in the church, I'm going to be in the church. Around the world. And you keep your heart down. You don't think you're destined to make home more important than the church that you're in. I can do it. But you can't go do that. They had their church in town. They had their church in there. They were hoping that a local pastor would have a big church. And then they got their church in there. And then they came out of the church and they planted and they took it to God. And they continued to remain in that community. And after a few years, they, they got the church home and they came in. Uh, and I was talking to one of the members of the church. And he said, Oh, no, we're not hoping to do that. We're hoping to start a church. We are. That's right. He's got to do it. He's so old school California. Brody to the house. Bad. Is that what that old school is? 80? Yeah. Yeah. Brody to the back. He outdoed the pastor. He signed the union to the money that is the church there. Call that. Rock. And the brother hit me and said, I'm a rock. Now, somebody's got to be the angel and talk to him and stronger that and use that to build the ministry. We don't use our ministry. We don't build our ministry. We don't need to to build our ministry. It's the ministry of God to the family and connect with the truth for a purpose and a reason to help and help the trip up the call of the Lord. You never saw Paul write back and say, the church of Jerusalem has outgrown you. I'm on my own, and you guys do what you want to do. No, as a matter of fact, he went back on those days. He had an answer to them. He didn't write an answer to say, I went back to the church at, at, at Jerusalem, but in all actuality, I'm now under me because I have one day. Watch that. <laughs> there can stay in the you that God wants to use you to keep you poor, and you can get over because you want people to have an attitude and that's the thing. He offered us the Lord. He came right back. He said, No. Man, I had to get some of that word that was a hunger that was dying. And the rest is history. Amen. Let's just pray for him. Father, thank you for this opportunity to share. Thank you for the Holy Ghost that directs and leads and guides us. Thank you that in our callings and our purposes, we fulfill your will. 